Hi, good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN, and I'm so excited to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Clint Smith and Dr. Marcus Campbell. Thanks for joining us. FAN is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year, and we're honored to have the robust support of dozens of schools, nonprofits, corporations, families, and individuals from across the country. We're committed to our vision of an informed and compassionate community, and will achieve that vision by presenting fresh ideas that elevate minds, expand hearts, and make the world a better place. We have hundreds of videos of past events archived on our YouTube channel, so be sure to subscribe to get updates when new recordings are posted. I have a few logistics to share. If you would please open chat so that you can access resources and links that will be posted throughout the program. Closed captioning is available. You may use the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen to submit questions throughout the event, and we'll look to answer a few of them towards the conclusion. Clint's new best-selling poetry collection, Above Ground, is available for purchase via our partner bookseller, The Bookstall, but we are also doing a random drawing from tonight's attendee list to give away copies of the book, and we'll notify recipients via email within a few days. And I also just found out from The Bookstall a couple days ago that Clint very nicely signed uh, a couple hundred book plates uh, that to be inserted into each of those books. So when you get the book, we'll have a signed book plate as well, which is so great. Thank you, Clint, for doing that. A special thank you to the 42 schools and organizations that are sponsoring tonight's event, and a huge thanks to our donors who keeps whose financial support keeps our programming free and open to all. And now for some introductions. Clint Smith is a staff writer at The Atlantic. He is the author of the 2023 New York Times bestselling poetry collection, Above Ground, and the, not, and the narrative nonfiction book, How the Word is Past, A Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America, which was a number one New York Times bestseller and winner of multiple prestigious awards, including the National Book Critics Circle Award for Nonfiction. Clint's essays, poems, and scholarly writing have been published in the New Yorker, the New York Times Magazine, the New Republic, Poetry Magazine, the Paris Review, the Harvard Educational Review, and elsewhere. He is a former National Poetry Slam champion and is the host of the YouTube series, Crash Course Black American History. Dr. Marcus Campbell has served as the superintendent of Evanston Township High School, District 202, since July of 2022. He was previously the assistant superintendent principal at ETHS, where he was responsible for providing leadership in the development of district strategy and organizational change, including effective instruction practices, impactful diversity and equity initiatives, and responsive programs and services. He provided administrative leadership to carry out the board's equity and excellence mission statement and oversaw the implementation of all district equity transformation programs, training, and initiatives. Whew. Dr. Campbell has served as a fan board member since 2015. That's eight years, Marcus. And we are grateful for his leadership and his partnership. And now let's welcome Clint Smith and Marcus Campbell to FAN. Thank, thank you, Lonnie. Uh, thank you to FAN for having us. And thank you, Dr. Smith, Clint, as we said, we were going to refer to each other tonight by our first names. Thank you for, for being here tonight. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, I am too. This is uh, um, quite a remarkable evening. And I guess we should start by um, saying that people know your work. And uh, this has been a tremendous sort of deposit into the into the culture, into the lives of those that uh, have been following you for for a little bit. And uh, in this this book, you hold space for love and the social political landscape, fear, happiness, climate change, dinosaurs. I mean, it's it runs a lot, and um, it's lighthearted, it's heavy, it's human. Um, so if poetry is the act of paying attention, and I'm quoting you, right, um, how does this book do that, Clint? You know, I think part of what this book tries to do is, is to put the, the granular in conversation with the universal. Um, I think we are living in a moment, and it feels like for, for years now, have been living in sort of series of cascading moments um, wrought with despair wrought with a sense of social, political, economic, ecological catastrophe. Um, and, and because of the way that our sort of media landscape and our media infrastructure operates now, we are constantly being bombarded and inundated with news about how um, horrific everything in the world is. And, and to be clear, there is a lot of really 
terrible unsettling stuff happening but i was you know i have a five-year-old and a four-year-old and i found myself experiencing what in some ways was a sort of dissonance but i i think what it what it really is is um a sort of the, the complexity of what it means to be human in the sense that i was experiencing these moments of interpersonal joy and levity and laughter with my kids and watching my kids sort of discover the world for the first time while amid the sort of larger backdrop of of catastrophe despair and anxiety that exists in our social and political landscape and and i'm interested in what it means to hold both of those and what it means to move through the world um contain you know in a in a in a moment where you are carrying both the laughter of your children and also the anxiety of a world that is burning and then how how we in our how we carry that in our bodies how we navigate the world in that way and also through the specific prism of parenthood thinking about you know how parenthood is this thing that is one of the most fun joyous remarkable uh parts of life if people choose to um to take that step and it's also one of the most difficult and one of the most humbling and one of the most exhausting um and one of the most fear inducing you know that parenthood is something that shows you parts of yourself that you love and parts of your life that you're really proud of and also shows you parts of yourself that you're not so proud of and parts of yourself that frankly you might be ashamed of and that you hadn't encountered until you became a parent and so i'm interested in in this book both through the prism of parenthood but also on a sort of larger human level just thinking about what it means to to navigate that both and in this um, of of our lives that animates so much of, of our daily existence yeah that is certainly the human experience right to hold space for laughter joy pain and 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 all of that and i just want to say just in the first few pages of of this journey um that the book does just that um how did the book come to you and um there's a little bit of story that i that i read in the new york times about the uh um about your trip to uh, monticello and the whitney plantation and the angola prison and you were turning to poetry to decompress so is is that how this book came about can you tell us a little bit about why the collection and and um you know what was the impetus for it all yeah you know i'm i'm always writing poems um whether and you know it's been seven years since my last book uh, book, book of poetry prior to this one uh, but I've I've been writing poems throughout those several years. It, it, poetry is not something that I write simply for the sake of being published. Poetry is, for me, both the creation of art, but also the mechanism through which I do my best thinking. It's sort mm -hmm. of how it makes sense. You said poetry for me is the act of paying attention and paying attention both to the external world, but also paying attention to my interior self, right? And sort of examining and reflecting and meditating on the way that I move through the world and the decisions that I make and the ways that my values may or may not align with my actions and all, all the sorts of things that um, we wrestle with when we slow down and uh, and sit with ourselves. And I think poetry is, is very much a, a sort of mindfulness practice for me because it is a, a time where I sit and have to interrogate and examine and excavate the, the way that I'm making sense of the world around me. Um, in ways that have, you know, frankly, are very easy not to, because we can always like pick the phone up and distract ourselves so that we're not actually sitting with um, how a moment, an image, a conversation, an idea made us made us feel. Um, and and I am guilty of that as much as anyone. You know, I think I put I write about this in the book. Like I put my kids down and I like start scrolling through Instagram reels as a way to like decompress at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and it can, if you're not careful, it can be very easy to not give yourself space at all to just be, you know, without any sort of additional stimulus. And, and so for me, you know, I'm always writing poems. Poems are how I make sense of the world. And, but these poems uh, in particular started um, uh, coming into the world in 2016. Um, my wife and I, and I write about this in the book, um, we're having conversations with doctors and found out we were, you know, having some fertility issues uh, and we had less than a 1% chance 
or we're told that we had less than a 1% chance of getting pregnant. Um, and, you know, I think for me, I, I began writing poems about that experience or that news uh, and, you know, what it meant to sort of begin to imagine a different trajectory for your life than the one that you had imagined with this person. Um, and that the infrastructure of your family, uh, the contours of your your life uh, and what that might look like might look different. And so again, like the poems are the way for me to excavate that within myself um, and to be honest with that, um, uh, about, honest about how I'm feeling within myself. And so I started writing about that. And, you know, we were very fortunate that we, we did get pregnant and then we got pregnant again. And so I um, was writing not only about the fear of not being able to have children, um, but then also what it meant to when my wife did become pregnant and how that felt both so miraculous and also so precarious. Uh, and then what it meant for to have a baby and then what it meant to have a toddler and then what it meant to have a toddler and a baby and then what it meant to just be tired all the time. Um, <laughs> and, and, and again, like, you know, so for me, my, my um, I have a friend, Safia Hilo, um, who's an incredible poet and writer herself. Uh, and I would sometimes think about these poems that I used to write, um, you know, look at poems from like college or something. And I'd look back at these poems and, and I'd be like, oh God, these poems are so terrible. They're so trash. Like, I can't even look at them. They're the worst. Like, who is that guy? Why is he reading like that? Why is he talking like that? Who's, and I'm talking about myself, obviously. Um, and she was like, you know, Clint, you can think about it like that. Or you could think about each poem as a time capsule that allows you to capture and remember who you were at these different moments in time. And you can almost use them as breadcrumbs, you know, to trace who you were and how remarkable is it? How fortunate are you to be able to use these poems as a way to remember and to trace who you've been at these different iterations of your life in ways that not everybody can. And I was like, well, that's a much more generous and beautiful rendering of like these poems are trash than, uh, than what I was, uh, was saying, but, but I, I've, held on to and been struck by that idea of um, the poem as a time capsule. And, and in relation to this collection, part of what these poems are doing are like capturing moments in time with my kids, with my family, uh, amid the sort of larger, again, social, economic, um, ecological and political backdrop that we live in, uh, and, and trying to hold on to these moments, whether moments of, of joy or moments of fear. Um, that I want to remember. It's almost as if the poem is the process of archiving, mm. um, the archiving my these different moments in my life, and and I find that to be um, really important for me, whether or not those these poems end up in a book uh, or not. Yeah, I love that. I mean, you know, as a English teacher myself, like just like you, thinking about poetry as mindfulness, right, and taking a pause. One of the things that we've tried to do with our students here in our district is to give them tools for mindfulness and um, what that means across the content. And um, I think it's a really important uh, point to like find tools or whatever, uh, whatever speaks to the individual and uh, to find peace, be in the moment, and to really understand those feelings and um, jot them down, right? In the act of journaling and writing poetry, however it comes. And so I think the teacher in me, you know, is responding and the, the human in me is also responding at the same time that it, it helps me to um, think about a desire for what I have for, for kids who um, are finding and, and needing an outlet to some of these things that are happening in them and around them. And I just, you know, I, so I was a high school English teacher, what, uh, 10, sort of nine years ago now. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'd be interested to hear, hear what you all think about this, you know, given that you're in schools and thinking about this all the time. But I, I think about this all the time with the sort of what social media was when I was a teacher is like nothing compared to obviously what it is now. And yeah. so, you know, I think about like, if I was still in the classroom, what it's almost as if the stakes are higher, right? Because you talk about like, you know, adults barely being able to put their phones down. Mm -hmm. Like you have these phones, these social media companies, this that were designed to addict, addict us to them, right? To make sure that we are never sort of exiting um, 
these these apps that are, are giving us constant stimulus um and for a young person you know i mean you're you are i'm surely well versed in all of these studies more so than me but it's just you know i think about my own kids and i'm like how will they where will the space be for them to just be yeah right? like where will the space exist for them to not feel as if they are uh constantly have to be um buzzing or as if they are constantly have to be comparing themselves to you know sort of highlighted versions of of people's lives but i you know i i'm really i think that poetry provides an opportunity yes it does for young people i think to again you know put the phone to the side and and as as it is for me you know excavate and and dig into these parts of how the world is making us feel you know an increasingly complicated uh world in ways that I worry they don't always give them spell give themselves space to do because I know that very few adults give themselves space to but the stakes feel higher in some way for young people. Yeah, it is. And and I'll just say that what we're finding for teachers who do engage in some of these practices, the kids do want it, right? They do want to put their phone down. They do want the break, right? They do want to be able to sit with themselves. And when you kind of expose them to it and you, they begin to experience it, they're like, yeah, that felt good, right? I want to do that again. Can we do that again tomorrow, <laughs> you know? And, um, but you know, it's a, it's always a work in progress. Um, but, you know, some of the feedback from the kids are that, yeah, it, this is something that we, that we appreciate that the teachers are taking the time to do. So, yeah. I wanna talk a little bit about, about parenting. You know, the book is in a large part about that. Um, for myself, fatherhood's a beautiful thing. I have two boys, you know, they are 13 oh, and 16. 13 and <laughs> 16. Oh man, you're like on the other end. Of the, <laughs> yeah, like I can't, I can't even imagine. Like I try to do this thing where I like look at my four year old and I look at my yeah. almost six year old, and I'm like, what are you gonna be like when you're a teenager? And I can't, I can't. My wife says she can see it perfectly, but I, I can't. I'm like, because I remember when they were like, you know, babies, and I remember I would look at them and I'd be like, I can't imagine, like I can't believe that you'll talk one day. Right. Like, I can't believe we'll have conversations and that's oh. all I can do is talk. Right. And one day, Clint, they're going to drive you around like my kids doing to me. <laughs> Excited about that. No, it's great because it's like, you know, speaking of social media, I do engage with social media with my kids. I sent my son a TikTok where this this one kid is like, you know, you used to put me in a chair and drive me around. Now I'm I'm in the driver's seat and I'm driving you around. And it's it's totally fascinating right, to be at this stage of fatherhood. And, you know, reading the book, it just took me back to those days. I mean, you have the the uh, they with the O to the first smile and just so many moments of fatherhood that just was like, you know, you know, taught me the beauty of what that is and what it means. And I want to ask the question, what is it like being a father? And what's it like being a father to, to Black children uh, in this social political context? Yeah. You? Yeah. No, it's, I mean, this is it's a question that I think, you know, we all, all Black parents, we wrestle with all the time, every day, um, in so many ways. Uh, you know, I... It was interesting. I was as I was reading and uh, to my kids and putting them to bed right before this. Um, I was sort of looking at their their libraries, um, little libraries we have in their rooms, and I think part of what I believe is when it comes to books and literature is that I, you know, I'm somebody who wrote an entire book about the history of slavery, right, and how how, you know. Great different book. historical sites across the country reckon with or fail to reckon with their relationship to the history of slavery. So I take very seriously um, what it means to to provide young people with a sense, uh, and specifically young Black children, with a sense of our collective history, uh, with a sense of understanding of the the policies and the social and historical realities that created the contemporary landscape of inequality today. Because I was somebody who didn't feel like I had a lot of that. Mm -hmm. I think I had it in an abstract way, but not specifically understanding that the, the sort of social infrastructure of the world that we live in 
was created by decisions that people have made over the course of the past several centuries. Right. Um, and if you fail to understand that, then what you do is you do what like most humans do, and especially most kids do, you look around and you make assumptions about why different people live in different sorts of ways. And it, you know, I remember being a kid growing up in, in New Orleans in the 90s, in the 80s and 90s, and just being inundated with these messages about all the things that were wrong with black people, that the reason there was so much crime in New Orleans, so much poverty, so much violence, that it all had to do with things that black people were doing wrong, were failing to do. Um, uh, and, and the onus was singularly on our community, even though we were the victims of uh, these social phenomena that were happening. And I didn't have the language or the toolkit with which to push back against it. Like I knew it was wrong, but I didn't know how to say it was wrong. And the thing that happens when you begin to inundate a child with information and don't give them the tools with which to push back against it, a child begins to internalize those messages. It's the sort of, it's both an insidious, but also a logical endpoint. That's right. Of, of an inundating a child with this, that sort of distorted pathology. Right. And it wasn't until later in my life, in my twenties, when I went to college, grad school, um, and started discovering these writers and journalists and artists who were writing about the history of this country in ways that I hadn't encountered before. And it's difficult to overstate the extent that it's difficult to overstate how freeing it was, how liberating it was to read this information that helped me understand why my city, my state, and my country looked the way that they do. And the, the, the information that helps you understand that the reason one community looks one way and another community looks another way is not because of the people in those communities, but is instead of what is because of what has been done to those communities generation after generation after generation. And so for me with my kids, I, I don't, I want them to have the language. I want them to have the tools. I want them to have a sense of that history that feels deeply important to me. Um, and so, you know, my kids have the books about, you know, the, the children's books about Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass and Malcolm X and Coretta Scott King and Ida B. Wells and, you know, <laughs> and, and all these folks and, and all these different moments. But they also have the books about the little black girl who wants to grow up and be a robot and the little black boy who wants to grow up and be a singer and the little black child who wants to grow up and be a bottle of ketchup, right? Like, because I want my kids both to understand their history, but also to understand that that history does not singularly define okay. their lives or does not singularly define the trajectory of their lives. That you have, you can both carry a sense of history of your people and also not have that history be something that anchors you That's right. and, and limits the possibilities of your life. And I, so I want my kids to only be limited by the sort of, the, the, I want their, the possibilities for their lives to only be limited by their imaginations. And so I think as a black parent, I try to both through the books we read and the conversations we have and, you know, the things, the different extracurriculars we do to, to provide that sort of both endedness. Uh, yeah. as much as possible. I love that because you do that in the book so clearly. I mean, you have these these uh, these selections, these poems so across generations, you have legacy, you have roots, but you also have for Willie Francis, the first known person to survive an execution by a lecture chair in 1947, right? So, I mean, this, you know, for those of you all who are watching, I mean, this 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 both andness uh, that Clint's talking about with regard to, you know, the history of of, of being black in this country is not just a, a singular, you know, experience of 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 trauma and negativity. It's also a very beautiful and and very proud uh, history when we look at our families and our grandparents and, and things like that. And you you capture that so well, and I I, I appreciated it. And you know. While reading the book, I, I found myself thinking about Trayvon Martin. And I'm like, why, why did I go back there? Right. You talk about being in the moment, right? And thinking. And I said, why, what? You know, why am I, what's up, what's going on in me that made me go back to the murder of Trayvon Martin? And it, it hit me that my kids were the age of your kids when Trayvon Martin was killed. And I remember when the verdict came out taking my boys to uh, the Rainforest Cafe just to, you know, process or, you know, as a family, like, like not be just 
sort of inundated with that kind of negativity, but I knew that I was worried, right? I also knew that I had beautiful children, but I knew that I, that I was worried. And I knew that there was going to be some things, uh, this balance of talking about being a Black man or Black man, because I have two boys in the world, but also saying that you're not going to be simply defined by that, right? And, and walking that balance and, and um, um, having them to grow up, you know, to love themselves, but also to understand that the, this complex world that they, that they live in. Yeah, absolutely. And to understand the sort of the, the heterogeneity of Blackness in and of itself, right? Yeah. Because I think even when I was growing up, you know, what it meant, the world would tell you that what it meant to be a Black man was a very specific thing, yes. right? right? And I want my kids to understand, as I want every Black child to understand, as I want every child to understand, that they're the decisions they make or the interests they have or the, the, the occupations they pursue should not be defined by the that single single part of your identity, right? And, and it's, it's the constant balance of, of wanting your kids to like be deeply proud yeah. of who they are and to be like deeply proud of that history and to and to look at their skin, to look at their hair, to look at their family, and to and to to say like, I am so proud to be a black person. I'm so proud of this history. I'm so proud to be uh, the manifestation of generations of struggle. That's right. Um, and you don't want your kid to be overwhelmed That's right. by that history. Yeah. And you want them to have the most expansive sense possible of who they want to be of of who they want to and can be in the world right you know whether you want to you know be a punk rock star or a basketball player or a emo poet or a, a cross player or a or you know a scientist whatever it is right like that that nothing that you can be all of those things and still be deeply proud of, deeply right. connected to, deeply tied to this sort of larger yeah. um, lineage. Um, thank you for that. I mean, I, I just, I want to move on, but I just want to, because it's, it's resonating with me. So I, growing up, I love the fact that I knew my great grandmother who was born in 1894, right? She, you know, she didn't have much, but yeah. she was a hundred years old when she died. And I'm like, my great grandmother was born in 1894. I mean, she had a lot to share with us as kids growing up that I remember because she didn't pass away until I was in high school. And so I'm just saying this is just, you know, the way you capture that, it, it was just it's it's beautiful, Clint. It, it really is. I, I just want to ask you. So, can you talk a little about your writing process? And um, but first, let me get to this. There was a so your first poem that you say you wrote was about the color gray. Can you can you share that experience in class? And then look, talk a little about your, your writing process. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I I shared this story when I was on the uh, late night sh the late show with Stephen yeah, Colbert. <laughs> it was just a wild moment in my life. I mean, really, like. I had this moment where I'm sitting on this couch and I'm like, man, this is where the the Avengers come to like promote their movie, you know, like this and here I am. I think the day before me was like Reese Witherspoon and the day after was like Lin-Manuel Miranda and I was just like some guy reading some poems. <laughs> um, so it was an incredible and really, really humbling experience um, that I was so grateful to to do. But, you know, he asked if I remember the first poem that I ever wrote. And the first poem that I remember um, is a poem I wrote in third grade, uh, and it went, uh, I, we were assigned to write a poem about a color. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I chose the color gray. Why? I don't know. I'm a, I was a strange and somber child. Um, and <laughs> it went, I hate the color gray. It reminds me of a rainy day. Gray, I really hate that color. It's annoying, like my little brother. <laughs> and my teacher came over to me, Miss Mueller. She came over, she put her hand on my shoulder, she looked at the poem, she read it, and she looked at me and she was like, Clint, that was beautiful. You can be a writer when you grow up. For all I know, she could have gone and said that to every single kid in the room, and I wouldn't know, right? But but I remembered that moment for the rest of my life. Mm. Uh, and I, it's not to create some sort of neat, neat, neat linear narrative, 
uh, right. between like, oh, Miss Mueller told me in third grade, and that's when I knew I was gonna like. I want to be a poet. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna be a poet. You know? um, but it always existed in my uh, consciousness as a sort of possibility. And you know, this is one of the things we can do over um, a Zoom event. I I told that story on this was the book came out March 28th. I told that story like three days later. And then I had event, an event in New Orleans, um, in my hometown, and I, uh, let me just go get it on here. And then I, uh, I went to the book signing line, and and Miss Mueller was there. What? <laughs> That's came, awesome. Um, <laughs> For my book signing and it was just like a wild surreal moment That's wonderful my third grade teacher showed up and uh had very that is wonderful heard me tell the story about her on on the uh, <laughs> people on national tv but it was a real treat it was a treat to see her again and i tell but i tell that story to teachers i know we got some teachers on here mm -hmm. like, you never know how a young person is going to be impacted by what you say um and you you because it's not the case that like miss mule told me that and I turned around as what an eight-year-old, nine-year-old, and was like, Miss Mueller, this moment <laughs> is gonna resonate with me for the rest of my life. Years later, I will tell the story. Right. How we sat in this classroom. On national television. <laughs> it's not because and and most teachers will never most people don't get an opportunity to talk about their teachers and what they did for them on national TV. They don't. And so yeah. most most of the time, like there's a version of this where Miss Mueller said this and and we'll never know how how much it impacted me but like you have to remember that even if you don't like you know you don't get a letter or an email one you know from your from your student saying so or even if they don't say it in the moment like the things you say matter so much they to your kids. It's, it's they stay with your kids the good things also the bad things and so just like being as mindful as possible about what you say to to your students um and never doubting the role that affirmation can play in um, sort of buffeting their their sense of self it's it is you know, we know as adults that if somebody comes in i remember when and you've you've been on both ends of this but like i remember when my principal would come in and do like a, a pop-in visit in my classroom and and you know you're like oh snap here we go like you know mm -hmm. like, make me look good <laughs> please, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um and I remember my principal, she would be like, you know, if, if it went well and she, you know, sent me an email or, or saw me in the hall, she was like, Clint, great job. Like, that was incredible what you were doing in the class. Like, it made me, that affirmation from her made me so, uh, it meant so much to me, right? And it made me more invested in her. It made yeah. me more invested in what I was doing. And this is as an adult, right? And so like, you multiply that to the nth degree for a young person. Right, like that line you wrote in your essay was like beautiful, or that point, the image in your poem just moved me so much, or that comment you made in class was so thoughtful. Like those things, they really, really stay with students. So uh, yeah. don't ever feel like you can do it too much. Yeah. So, so what about your pro? Right. Well, I got a couple of questions. One about your process, and um, like your revision i remember hearing tony morrison say she would go to a bookstore pull one of her <laughs> books off the shelf and have a pencil and she can do the market up right so what about your process you know your revision to the coats you know he says it his he starts his suckage right so whether you're writing in polls or poetry like what's what's your process and what's what's your your methodology a, a bit you know i um my a friend and mentor, um, Imani Perry, uh, the incredible scholar and writer um, at Princeton, just won the National Book Award for her latest book. Um, we had lunch after my son was born. So this was five, six years ago. Um, and I remember, and she has two kids herself. And, and to know her is to know how prolific she is as a writer. You know, um, I think she's had like five or six books come out in the last three, four years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I was like, you know, it's just so much harder for me to find the time to write in the way that I was before. And she mm -hmm. was like, Clint, you got to let go of this idea that you're going to have these like long, luxurious times to write where you can, you know, find, you know, sitting in the 
at your desk next to the window was <laughs> a cup of uh, chamomile tea and your and the light sort of coming in through the window and striking your cheek just so and you know whatever you know your Kenny G playlists or whatever it is that you're, <laughs> you're vibing to um, she was like you have to disabuse yourself of that idea and you've got to write when you can where you can and and even if it's just like 10 minutes like that paragraph you write in 10 minutes if you do that every day that adds up right that becomes a page becomes a chapter becomes a book um and i really took that to heart and so i i in terms of process my writing process i mean i write everywhere um i write in the notes section of my iphone i write on napkins and notebooks on my ipad on my laptop um i write uh during kids my kids nap time i write when i'm waiting at the barber shop to get my beard trimmed i wait when i'm at the dmv i write wait i, I write, write during uh episodes of peppa pig and my kids are watching you know I, like, i'm i am indiscriminate um and i just find time and i find that it adds up right i i got i had to i had to be much more proactive in creating time for myself to write um and and also proactive in making a decision to use those 10 minutes to write something rather than to sort of like do the endless endless scroll that can be so easy to be clear like i would I, I, it's not every time i had 10 minutes i'm like sitting and trying to write something um profound sometimes i'm like watching a you know dog do the tango on tiktok right it just it depends on the moment. um so i don't want to create a distorted picture of of, uh, of my level of focus but um but I, I i do try to use those moments that might otherwise be considered uh as like not enough time by some people uh to to write down some ideas right now i'm doing a 30 for 30 with uh two friends um 30 for 30 is when you try to write a poem or a piece of prose every day um, of the month and we email it to each other and it's a sort of like gentle accountability so what's today may 11th and so like theoretically you're supposed to have sent like 11 poems or 11 excerpts or 11 uh, and and i i find that sort of accountability to be really helpful um and it's you know it is not it's great because there's no punishment like if you don't i think i have like six out of the 11 right now and i'm like i'm gonna catch up will i catch up i don't know but like but when you see your friends like you know send a poem over or send a piece of writing over you know it i know for me in those moments like especially like at the end of the night after i've cleaned the kitchen and like made the kids lunches for the next day and i might you know sit down and kind of just mess around on my phone, I use that like 15 minutes to say like, all right, let me write something. And um, and those things, that's how much of this book was written too, in those sort of 30 for 30 processes. And, and again, sometimes that's like writing in the notes section of your iPhone, sometimes it's on your laptop, sometimes it's in a notebook, um, and then you take a screenshot of it and send it, but but it just, it depends. Um, and I write, I write a lot on airplanes and in airport terminals, yeah, I just, I think that I've I've become very good at reading and writing wherever uh, is necessary uh, because my life takes me in so many different places and and now my kids are getting older and you know we're like driving to soccer practice and dance class and and all those things so I'm now I'm I'm cre you know trying to figure out how to write uh, write during soccer practice and and all those uh, all those kind of things so it's a it's a they're seasoned to our lives and they're absolutely. Seasoned. Uh, where I'll be doing my writing, I imagine. Well, we, we want you to read a little bit, but before we do that, I have I have one more question, and, and that is, what do you say to, to young people who want to be writers? Um, as, a, as a student I was talking to today, I, I released the class of 2023 today, right? As a superintendent, I get on the thing because we're one unit district, and I say, congratulations to the class of 2023, and they all like just walk out of the school. Are they and done, when I'm seeing, huh? they're done school? 
They, well, yeah, they're, they're, today was our singers last year of school, yeah. Oh, look at those singers, <laughs> dumb school, that's amazing. I know, right? <laughs> they were happy. They were really happy today. And we had good weather in, in Chicago and in Evanston. But so, but I had a kid tell me today that, you know, she's going to go and major in creative writing down, down at the U of I and all of that. What do you say to young people or anyone who's listening or will watch this uh, who aspire to, to write uh, and want to and wanna be writers and, and, and any advice that you would have on publishing and anything like that? Yeah, I would say, I think writing is an interesting thing in which some people assume that like, if you don't sit down and write like a beautiful draft the first time, that you're not a good writer. And, and I find that to be strange that we put that sort of pressure or come in with that sort of expectation in the world of writing in ways that we don't in other sort of facets of our lives. For example, I played soccer growing up my whole life. Um, I thought writing was like my backup career. I thought I was gonna be a professional soccer player, playing for Arsenal, living yeah. in London, like, you know, doing my thing. And then you grow up and you realize that uh, Louisiana is not a hotbed of soccer talent against which to compare your skills on, on a global level. So I, I played through high school, played in college, um, but, uh, but quickly realized that like the trajectory of my life was taking me in a different direction. But when you play soccer, for example, when you play any sport, you don't just show up to the game and score a hat trick. You don't just show up to the game and, and expect to, to play an amazing game. You put in hours and hours of work during practice that people, most people never see. So that the manifestation of that practice is what people see on the field. When you play a musical instrument, you don't just show up to the concert and play like Bach or Coltrane. You put in hours and hours of work that people never see when you practice so that when you show up at the concert or the recital, they are seeing the manifestation of that work. And for me, writing is the same thing, right? When I wrote How the Word is Passed, for example, I wrote, I spent a year and a half writing what I thought was going to be the first chapter of that book. I wrote probably 40 to 50,000 words um, mm -hmm. that ultimately got thrown out and not included in the book. And that's like a year, a year and a half, basically, of, of writing. Um, and it would be easy to see that as, as a waste, right? Like as a waste of time, as failure. But I kind of, I think of it in the same way that I think going to soccer practice, the same way that I think of going, like practicing your, your flute, your piano, your drums, like you put in a lot of work that people never see, but putting in that work, the excavation and the process of that writing is what made what's in the book possible, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I had to write those 50,000 words to get to the first word of what would ultimately be the book. This poem, this book of poetry has like 70 something poems in it. I wrote hundreds of poems to get to these 70, right? Like mm -hmm. hundreds of poems over the course of the last six, seven years that aren't included here. But I had to write those poems in order to get to the poems that were worthy of being published. And so that's a long way of saying like, not everything you write is going to be um, worthy of being in a book or worthy of being in a book the first time you write it, right? Many of these poems, are first, when I first wrote them, they were trash and terrible. <laughs> and I had to like, work on them over and over. Revision is the real writing process. And you'll hear yeah. writers talk about that over and over again. But it's like when you were when you're doing pottery, right? Like you you have to put the clay on on the spinny thing. I don't know if the spinny thing you gotta put the clay on the spinny thing in order to have something to even make the pot. Right. And so writing is almost like just putting like the words on the page is the equivalent of putting the clay on the spinny thing. And once the words are on the page, then you can like rewrite it, reshape it, sort of, you know, take that mess and turn it into something. Um, and, but, but no one in the same way that a potter doesn't have the pot as soon as they put it there, a writer doesn't have the pages or the book as soon as they put the words there. It takes a lot of work after the fact. So, you know, writing is practice and writing is work and, and to write a bad draft or to write something that doesn't feel good at the beginning, it doesn't mean you're not meant to be a writer. Uh, it means that you're doing the work that is necessary 
in order to get to the writing that ultimately you'll feel more proud of. All right. So just quickly, some people want to know, like my friend Rick C in Chicago, are you having some sort of follow up to how the word is, is passed? Some folks want to want to know a little bit of that. Is there going to be another, uh, you know, something coming um, after that or more coming? Yeah, it's uh, my uh, I had a friend who was like, if you do a sequel to how the word is passed, you got to call it too past too furious. <laughs> um, so just make it a make it a franchise. Um, but they got the like, is it Fast and the Furious 10 now that's coming out? Um, Something like that. <laughs> I don't know if we'll have 10 how the word is passed, but um, I am, uh, I've, I've been really, some of you might be familiar, I wrote a cover story for The Atlantic at the end of last year about how Germany memorializes the Holocaust mm. um, and putting that in conversation with the way that the United States remembers or feels to remember uh, the history of slavery through our iconography, through our sort of landscape of public memory. And, uh, I am in the early stages of working on a book that is exploring, um, uh, taking a sort of similar approach and conceit to how the word is passed, but uh, thinking about World War II sites and how we remember the history of World War II uh, and what stories are included in our narrative and what stories aren't included in that narrative. You know, when I was taught about World War II and even what I, you know, largely what I have known for most of my life about World War II was mostly shaped by uh, Saving Private Ryan and Band of Brothers, Tom Hanks, Steven Spielberg. Um, and, but that is only like a, that is a part of the World War II story, but it's a very specific part. Um, and so I'm interested in like uh, going to spend time at uh, the internment camps where Japanese Americans were incarcerated. I'm interested in spending time uh, on the Navajo reservation, learning about what it meant to be a Navajo code talker, being taken you know, being told as a child that you should go to this boarding school that was meant to strip you of your language. And mm. then being asked by that same country to use that very language to fight on behalf of the same country that was trying to strip you of the language and yeah. strip you of your land. I'm interested in going to Hiroshima. I'm interested in going to Nagasaki. I'm interested in going to Seoul and exploring the history of uh, women who were subjected to sexual slavery by the Japanese military. Interested in going to the Pacific Islands and thinking about the, the countries and the islands that exist at the nexus of the history of Japanese imperialism and American colonialism, uh, Argentina, where the Nazis fled, Tunisia, where the North African front of the war was, that doesn't often get remembered. So um, that's how I'll be spending the next few years. If you see me, if you see me on Instagram all over the world, that's, uh, that's probably what I'm doing. Well, we can't wait for this. <laughs> Man. I know we're running short on time and Lonnie's going to pop on here in a minute, but can you pick a, a poem or two to, to read for us before, before we go? Um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll do two, two quick ones. Um, I'll read the first poem of the book uh, that I think is in many ways the sort of thesis statement of the project. Um, and it's called All at Once. The redwoods are on fire in California. A flood submerges a neighborhood that sat quiet on the coast for three centuries. A child takes their first steps and tumbles into a father's arms. Two people in New Orleans fall in love under an oak tree whose branches bend like sorrow. A forest of seeds are planted in new soil. A glacier melts into the ocean and the sea climbs closer to the land. A man comes home from war and holds his son for the first time. A man is killed by a drone that thinks his jug of water is a bomb. Your best friend relapses and isn't picking up the phone. Your son's teacher calls to say he stood up for another boy in class. A country below the equator ends a 20 year civil war. A soldier across the Atlantic fires the shot that begins another. And scientists find a vaccine that will save millions of people's lives. Your mother's cancer has returned and the doctors say there is nothing else they can do. There is a funeral procession in the morning and a wedding in the afternoon. The river that gives us water to drink is the same one that might wash us away. Wow. And then uh, this one uh, gives you, it's a different vibe um, and gives you a sense of the, the sort of scope of the, the project. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm always interested in um, using the poems to, to sort of capture specific moments, um, to capture specific things with my kids that I want to remember. 
Um, and one of the things that my kids love to do, uh, that we love to do with my kids is have dance parties after dinner. Um, unfortunately, my children have no rhythm, um, which is, you know, kind of cute right now, but uh, devastating if it could going to be in trouble later on. <laughs> I'm like, oh man, like for your sake, we got to get this together. Um, but, uh, but we, we love a dance party and, and this poem is, uh, is entitled Dance Party. Sometimes in the evenings after dinner, after the spaghetti has been slurped and I have bribed the bro broccoli into their bellies, I give both of my children the look. When my eyes meet theirs, they know what time it is. They push in their chairs, they stretch their legs, and we move the table to the far end of the dining room to clear space for what we all know is coming. Alexa, play the post-dinner dance party playlist. And within seconds, Martha Wash's booming voice rolls like thunder over our bodies. Everybody dance now. The electronic keyboard and the drums meet in the middle of the room like two dinosaurs ready to claim the kitchen as their own. Immediately, the jumping begins, and my daughter is flinging her limbs like an offbeat octopus, hands slapping the air behind her as if she is trying to smack anyone who enters her sacred space. I turn around, and my son is doing a robot, or is being eaten by a robot, or is trapped in a universe where robots take over the bodies of little boys in peanut butter pajamas. Nonetheless, there is a robot somewhere, and my children, bless them, have not yet learned how to clap on the two and four. So I laugh, but also cringe as their small hands make a mockery of the melody around them. Now, halfway through the song, everyone is jumping, and I, caught up in the ecstasy of this moment, fall to the ground and convince this no longer young body that it is a good idea to start doing the worm. And when my children see me, their eyes become pools of possibility, and it's clear they see, it, see this as a clarion call to climb onto my back. And now, here we are, this strange trifecta, this unlikely trio, a robot and an octopus riding on the back of a worm who will certainly need some Tylenol before bed. <laughs> and it is in this moment that their mother comes home. And when she opens the door, everyone is screaming, the speakers are blasting, and the percussion is shaking every wall around us. We look up at her, and she looks down at us, and we have no explanation for this strange scene, only an invitation for her to join. <laughs> Nice. That's awesome. Um, thank you for sharing that. And, and thank you. I, you know, before we go, I just got to say there is a brilliant grammar lesson in this in this book, too. And it's called the poem is called Punctuation. <laughs> I loved everything about it. I loved everything about this book. That one's for the English teachers out there. Oh, yeah, that's right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Smith, for this conversation. I, I have a whole other list of questions. I could talk to you for another hour. Oh, it always goes by so fast. Yeah, they do. They do. I think Lonnie's coming on with some with some remarks and some questions from the from the crowd tonight. Well, I, I'm thinking that it, how long is that punctuation poem? I want to hear it. Let's go. You gotta read. You gotta see it. Right? I know. I know. I mean, I've read it. I'm just saying. Oh. I, I, guess right. I guess that's true. You, you maybe do have to see it. But yeah, uh, Marcus, I, mean, I, I could read it. It's okay. Uh, yeah, let's like because you know nobody wants my question. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. It's uh, let's see how this one operates when read. Um, but I, you know, so I'm interested in um, just another way to play with language and to think about when when a punctuation mark is added to a sentence or a thought or an idea, how it changes the meaning of that sentence. So, so I'll see if I can make that come across in, in my reading. Punctuation. I went to the store filled with water. I went to the store filled with water. The store is submerged or I'm crying in the aisles. There's something in your eyes I can't get out. There's something in your eyes I can't get out. I'm trying to help or I'm trying to run away. I'm scared you don't really know me. I'm scared you don't really know me. I am expressing concern about where we're going or I am making a declaration of where we are. The wind carried my mother's voice away after the storm came. The wind carried my mother's voice away after the storm came. 
My mother is grieving all that she lost, or I am grieving the loss of my mother. There are new flowers on the trees I climbed every day as a child. There are new flowers on the trees. I climbed every day as a child. I am relishing the cycle of renewal, or I am lamenting that something has taken my place. It's hard for me to say I am not always the man I want to be. It's hard for me to say I'm not always the man I want to be. I'm trying to be honest with myself, or I'm trying to be honest with you. Mm. Yeah, good. That's good. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Um, thank you both for such a, a lovely conversation. I had it in my gut that, you know, two former English teachers, both parents, both brilliant men, um, just in an arc of a career that is just so amazing, each one of you. Um, I'm so I'm so glad that the two of you had an opportunity to sit together. Um, so thank you, Marcus, very much, of course. And we're looking forward to seeing you again tomorrow night in person uh, for our event with Brian Lowry. Um, we're at 7.56. I have a couple of questions where I remind folks we're going to go through the Zoom attendance form that we'll, we'll download it tonight. We'll take a look at the report and we'll be sending out free copies of Clint's books. So either pick them up at the bookstall if you near, live nearby or we'll mail them out to you. Um, Clint, thank you so much for signing book plates and having them sent along. We're very grateful for that as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Um, so I'm gonna jump into a question that Brittany had posed uh, during the event. She says, I'm sorry if you already answered this, but why did you choose Above Ground as the title of the book? And what does that title mean to you? um above ground you know it's it's meant to um as as has been alluded to um this evening part of the book part of what the book is trying to do is like extend um attention and gratitude um for the simple fact of that we get to be alive you know and that we get to look out of the window and and see the sun and see the trees and see flowers and I get to watch these two little humans, you know, grow up and and discover the world and discover who they are in the world. Um, I get to, you know, sit down, you know, leave this this conversation and go sit down and watch a TV show with my wife and eat some kettle corn, which is delicious. And uh, you know, just like it's the simple things about how, again, you know, as I said, like. I think we can get caught up in the in the endless cycle of despair of what it means to be alive right now, but there's also so much to be grateful for. And I just wanna be able to hold both of those. So above ground is a sort of like, we are all above ground and there's so much within that experience to hold. Um, and, I, and I think also, you know, it is the, the title poem above ground is about um, this moment where my kids were four and two and in the uh, mid-Atlantic, you know, in the sort of Maryland, D.C., Virginia region, uh, we had a big cicada sort of uh, <laughs> reckoning almost, you know, where like <laughs> all these cicadas come uh, every, you know, 17 years is the way their life cycle works. They live for 17 years underground. They come up for a few weeks, they mate, and then they die. And they had this moment where, you know, there was this buzzing that was surrounding, you know, everywhere we went for so long and then suddenly stopped and the ground is this sort of uh sort of membrane of cicada ex cicada exoskeletons like everywhere you look and my kids were like going around and having a contest to pick them up to see like who could pick up the most cicadas um and put them in and they had their little halloween buckets and they were trying to see who could um uh, pick the most of pick most of them up as if they were uh treasure that they were collecting i had this moment where i was watching from my porch and I was like, man, the next time the cicadas come, my children will be 21 and 19. And it was just, I think, emblematic of how fleeting some of these moments are when you're a parent, how if you don't hold on to it, if you don't like see it and in that moment recognize that that moment, like my children walking around and like laughing and throwing cicadas at each other and putting them in their buckets, like it will never happen again like that then then you lose it and you lose a sense of how special it is to be in that moment and it can be hard right like being a parent is hard and sometimes you're you're tired and you're exhausted and like it starts off really lovely and they're like 
chasing each other with cicadas and then <laughs> bumps their head and then it's chaos right um but i i try my best to remember that like you know it's these moments that make life worth living and, and if we don't pay attention to them um, then we lose a big part of, of why we're here in the first place well, thank you for that so we're at eight o'clock everyone thank you so much for coming